Galatians chapter 6 is where we're at this morning. Galatians chapter 6, we read these verses just a little bit ago. We have just two messages left in the book of Galatians this week and next uh, before we conclude our study here. It's been a blessing to me. I hope that it has been to you. Uh, And this morning we're going to look at verses 11 to verse number 15. Uh, We'll also look at verse 15 again next week uh, because uh, I I, I didn't quite get all I wanted to into this message uh, on that verse. You study American history, and you look at the beginnings and and why people came. Uh, I remember in class in high school, they taught us three reasons that people were compelled to come to this land of opportunity, especially at the beginning. Why the explorers set sail? You know, in those days, it was a risky thing to sail across uh, the Atlantic. It was a risky thing, both from disease and, and you could get thrown off course. There's no guarantee that you would make it to your destination. Uh, why risk your life? And they would give three reasons. They would say, uh, for some, it was gold. Uh, there was a fortune to be made in the new world, and many set sail for that purpose. The second reason that they gave was for glory. Uh, people would come and, and travel across because they want to bring glory to themselves. Uh, even now, throughout Northport, uh, we've got a couple of streets named after Ponce de Leon, uh, and uh, we see the glory that he still receives for his exploits, and and there were many that were involved in that, and that was their reason to go. Then we find ones like the pilgrims. They set sail, and they risked so much. In fact, about half of them died within the first year uh, of them coming to the new world, and they came for a third reason, that was God. Some came for gold, some came for glory, some came for God, and that freedom to serve God and to live uh, as uh, their conscience would direct them to live. And you know, it's interesting when you think about that was their purpose in coming for gold, for glory, for God. It was also revealing what their treasure was. If you set sail for for glory, well, that's the thing that you valued the most. You're going to risk your life and give up everything that you knew for glory. Others that would risk so much for gold and others that would risk so much for God. It's interesting in our lives, the things that we do reveal our treasure as well. Reveal who we are, why we're here, and where we're going in our own minds, in our own lives. And uh, again, we can live for those same reasons, maybe others. But this morning we find the Apostle Paul in his purpose in life, and what it was that he was after, and what it was that he was seeking. In fact, in these verses, in verses 12 and 13, we find another group of people and what their life was all about, The Apostle Paul says in verse 14, however, for him, he says, God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want to speak to you this morning on that subject, glory in the cross, glory in the cross. And uh, as we begin, may we pause and ask the Lord to meet with us and speak to our hearts. Uh, So let's pray. Father, I come to you today. And Lord, we come with that desire, Lord, that you would speak to us. Lord, that these moments would not be lived in vain. Lord, we know that except the Spirit come and move, it is vain. So, Lord, I pray for His filling. I pray for His moving. Lord, I ask that each one that's here, all of us, Lord, as we gather in Your presence and seek a blessing from You, Lord, may we all hear from You. May Your Word, even the Word as it was read, may it speak to our hearts and Lord, bring that conviction where it's needed. Lord, I pray that it would bring that encouragement where it's needed, that comfort where it's needed. But Lord, in all things, that you'd be glorified in these moments and in our response to your word. Uh, Lord, I ask today that you would do these things by your grace and for your glory. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I have have you to note the first thing in these verses. In verse number 11, how the Apostle Paul begins to enter into this truth is with a passionate plea. You see in verse 11 these words that the Apostle Paul wrote as he is winding down his epistle to the Galatians. He says, Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. And he notes the Apostle's handwriting. The first thing that we see, he, he refers to the large letter that he has written. Now when he speaks of a large letter, it could be an expression referring to the length of the epistle. However, this letter is not a particularly 
large letter that he's written. In fact, if you were to compare it to the epistle to the Romans, 16 chapters, or the first book of 1 Corinthians, 16 chapters, or 2 Corinthians, 13 chapters, Ro- uh, um, Hebrews, excuse me, 13 chapters, Galatians is not a large letter by any means. So I don't believe that he's referencing when he says, you see how large a letter I've written, I don't believe he's referencing the length of the epistle. Instead, more likely, the expression refers to the size of the characters that he wrote. In other words, he wrote with a large print. He wrote in large print as he sent this letter to them. And this statement, combined with what we saw in Galatians 4, in fact, look back in Galatians chapter 4, seems to imply that the Apostle Paul had an eye disorder. Back in Galatians chapter 4, we saw this. He says in in verse 13, you know how through infirmity or through uh, disability in the flesh, I preached the gospel unto you at the first. What was this infirmity? What was this weakness? What was this disability that he was struggling with? You'll notice in verse 15, where is in the blessedness you spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and given them to me. Based off of what he wrote in Galatians 4, and now what we see in Galatians chapter 6, it seems quite evident that the Apostle Paul had an eye disorder. There are some who believe that it was something that even uh, was, was kind of ghastly to behold. If you looked at him, you would maybe see his eyes oozing. And that's where he spoke of the Galatians, how they didn't reject him, even though they saw this and and he was ugly to behold, yet the Galatians' heart went out to him. And so in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 11, when he says he wrote with a large letter, the explanation is because he had trouble seeing. And so he wrote larger characters because that was necessary as he was writing the epistle. You'll also notice that he says, I've written this with my own hand. Now, H.A. Ironside points out it was not usual for a man to write his own letters in those days. There were people employed to that task. Even the Apostle Paul would utilize other men to pen his letters as he, uh, as he gave them the words to write down in many other instances. But in this case, with the Galatians, either there wasn't somebody else available to him, or maybe the Apostle Paul uh, didn't want to wait for someone to become available, Or it could have been that he was just so stirred about the Galatian people that he sat down and wrote this thing himself. And again, in those days, with such a large font, if you will, that he was writing with, uh, it would have required a lot more paper, a lot more work. And, And so he is expressing here his heart. Notice the apostle's heart. Why is he telling the Galatians this? Why is he, why is he expressing this? Again, the Galatians knew Paul. They had seen his struggles, particularly with his eyes. And so he's saying, I wrote this with my own hands. Look at the large letters that I I wrote with. Notice all of this. I'm pouring my heart out to you. He's expressing that he's writing out of a genuine love and compassion for them. His motivation for writing wasn't personal glory or just to obtain a following. No, the apostle Paul here was putting himself in, in, a, in a difficult place, he was sacrificing himself and going through this great tedious labor to get these words to the Galatians. And so he's expressing his heart. In Galatians chapter 4 again, in verse number 19, he, he spoke there, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you. He says, when I first was with you, it's like I was laboring, like a, like a mother in labor in order to to bring you into a spiritual life, and and not just that, but to see you grow in Christ. And and so he likened his own work with the Galatians to that same intense labor. I would also say and point this out, the Apostle Paul in this is an example to us of what he taught us in verse number one of this chapter. Remember there, he says, Brethren, if a man be overtaken in a fault, you which are spiritual, restore such a one. And that's what the apostle Paul's doing. Remember the Galatians had fallen. They'd fallen into false teaching. They were there uh, 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 being led astray and the apostle Paul was burdened for them and seeing them fallen, he is now pouring out his heart to try to bring them back to the truth. 
And he gives us an example. When somebody walks away from the faith, when somebody begins to fall into sin, what should be our response? It's to plead with them. They are, uh, they are worth it. Their life, their soul, and God's glory in their life. We should go to them and pour out our own heart. And, and we see the Apostle Paul, the extent that he was willing to go to, even through his own infirmity, to try to bring them back to Christ. And I wonder, even as we think of that, do we have such a heart for people? Are we willing to sacrifice ourselves to lift the fallen or to reach the lost? I think all too often we look at what's convenient. Well, it's not convenient for me right now. It'll be hard for me right now. We notice how convenient it was for the Apostle Paul. It wasn't convenient at all. It was a hard thing. And yet he gave himself for them. So we notice in the passage, he begins with this passionate plea. But notice the second thing, if you would, in verses 12 to 13. The second thing is the pharisaical preacher. So he's going to now begin to develop for us not only his own motivations for what he's doing, but now he shows us the false teachers. Throughout this epistle, Paul has spoken of men who were not like him, not only in their teaching, but in their motivation. From chapter 1, the Apostle Paul spoke of those who troubled the Galatians. He said they perverted the gospel of Christ. That is, they twisted it. They mixed it with, they mixed that truth with error. And so they perverted the gospel. In Galatians chapter number 4, uh, chapter 5, excuse me, these men hindered the Galatians and the Christian race. And, uh, uh, the, and, and so Paul did not mince words about the false teachers. He declared they were accursed because of what they were preaching, and they were leading the Galatians astray. And I would say this this morning, if false teachers were prevalent in Paul's day, how much more prevalent are false teachers today? In fact, the Apostle Paul wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4 that in the last days, men would heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And boy, what, a, what an image that is. Heaps of teachers. There's so many of them. And it says having itching ears, they want to hear something new. The people in the, the congregations want to hear what somebody's going to tell them that they want to hear. And the Apostle Paul said it would be like that in the last days. So Paul dealt with false teachers a lot. You and I have false teachers on every hand. Whether it's something as you turn on the television whether it's something as you go to YouTube, whether it's something you go to radio, whether you go to the Christian bookstore, there are false teachers and false teachings everywhere. In this passage, he's going to deal with some of that again. Notice what he makes, first of all, makes us to know about these pharisaical preachers. First of all, we see their demands. In verse 12, he says, As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised. The particular false teaching that Paul's been dealing with in the book of Galatians is that in order for one to be saved, we not only must believe on Jesus Christ, but we must also keep the Old Testament, the Old Testament laws. Whether that's Sabbath keeping, uh, whether that was the dietary restrictions, but most of all, you had to be circumcised. If a man was not circumcised, then a man was not saved according to these false teachers. The Apostle Paul has been dealing with that all the way throughout this, throughout this epistle. And of course, we understand circumcision was an important sign, a sign of the covenant between Israel and God. It was a sign that was given to Abraham. And so Abraham, even in his advanced age, almost 100 years of, of age, was willing to go through that surgical procedure and have his whole household to be circumcised. And that was carried all the way through the time of Christ. Jesus was circumcised on the eighth day. So was the Apostle Paul. But when the church came, the sign of circumcision was no longer demanded. If you go back to Galatians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul already dealt with it. In fact, he had a man there with him who was one of Paul's disciples, one of his students, one that he was mentoring named Titus. And he brought Titus back to Jerusalem. And he pointed out to the Galatians, when I brought Titus with me, Titus was not a Jew, Titus was not circumcised, and Titus was not required to be circumcised either by me or by the other apostles. They received him into the fellowship without circumcision. Circumcision is fine if you want to do it, but you don't have to do it in this time in which we live. 
You're part of the church. You don't have to be circumcised. It's not a demand. That's an Old Testament specific law. And there's many laws like that. Again, Sabbath keeping, dietary restrictions. We've seen that those are not demanded of us today. As I often say, you can get yourself a bacon cheeseburger on your birthday, right? You can enjoy those things because we're not under those Old Testament restrictions. But Pharisees, even these people that had come into Galatia, they make demands of people that God does not. In Christ's day, some of those demands not only added, but actually undermined the commandments of God. Jesus referred to these as teaching for commandments the doctrines of men. He said by their traditions they made the word of God of none effect. So to these teachers, these legalizers as we've called them, who made keeping commandments necessary for salvation, even these have distorted God's truth. We are saved by grace apart from the works of the law. They're not part of our salvation. And if you add works to grace, you can't add works to grace. The two cannot be mixed. If you attempt to do so, you have defiled and perverted the grace of God. Or as Paul says in Galatians, you have frustrated the grace of God. Now, notice in, the, in this passage in Galatians 6, we see the demand of the false teachers. Notice also their deficiency. Look at what he says in verse number 13. For neither they themselves who are circumcised keep the law. The thing about the Pharisees and what was true of these false teachers and preachers in Galatia is that while they demand that others keep the law, they themselves don't keep the same laws. They don't even do what they're expecting others to do. The law is an all or nothing matter. Recall the words of Galatians chapter 3 where Paul quoted the law itself. Here in Galatians 3, Paul had said, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things that are written in the book of the law to do them. How much do you have to continue in in order to not be cursed by the law? How much? All things. And the word is continueth. How often do you have to keep the law in order to be made righteous by the law? All the time. So that James wrote in his epistle, again, writing to Jewish people, he said, if you keep the whole law and offend in just one point, you are guilty of all. That's the way law works. The law says, thou shalt not. And so if you do, you are guilty. The law was not written to commend us to God. The law was written so we would understand we're condemned before God. None of us can keep those holy laws, and it brings us to Christ. And we understand that. Today, we have people that want to pick and choose which laws to keep and think that they're good. I'll, I'll ask people, hey, are you good in the sight of God? And people will tell me, well, yes, I am. I'll say, well, explain how you're good. Well, I've never killed anybody. <laughs> Again, such a low hurdle to have to cross over. Never killed anybody. All right, well, have you lied? Well, once in a while. <laughs> well, I was a kid. I was like, that's a lie, you know? Have you ever had somebody tell you, I only lie in order to help people? <laughs> that's my generous heart, you know? I, I lie to keep them from things that would hurt them. You know, and the reality is, no, you're a big fat liar even right now. You know, not just a liar, a big fat liar, right? That's what we say as a kid. And we all lie. How many lies have we spoken? They're innumerable. Pride itself is believing a lie about ourselves. We lie to ourselves all the time. That's just one of God's commands. You say, well, I kept this one. Well, you have you kept that one. We could go through all the list of God's laws. Who has kept God's laws? And the answer is nobody. There is not a just man upon the earth who doeth good and sinneth not. The Bible is clear about that. So today when you have people, and maybe that's you today, and you think, oh, I'm going to get to God by being good, understand God's already declared there is none that doeth good, not even one. So that would exclude you as well. Give up trusting yourself and your own goodness, come to see your own hideousness as a sinner before God and fall on the mercy and grace of Jesus Christ, which we'll look at in just a moment. 
It's interesting that the Apostle Paul, who was previously an actual Pharisee, and in his words, a Pharisee of the Pharisees, would look at these false teachers' attempt to promote themselves as law keepers, and Paul is just not impressed. They don't even keep the law. They don't know what they're talking about. These are imitators. But I want us to note the main emphasis of the Apostle Paul in verses 12 and 13 and why he brings up these Pharisees, and that is their desires. Three times he reveals to us a desire of the Pharisees. Why were they doing what they were doing? Why is a false teacher in the work that he's in? Why are there so many false teachers in America today? And here the Apostle Paul gives us three of the reasons, three of the motivations. Notice number one. He says in verse 12, as many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh. The fair show is to speak of a good looking appearance. They want to appear righteous before people. They want to impress men. They like the notoriety. They like to be able to say, hey, look at me. Remember how the Pharisees in Jesus' day would pray? They would stand on the street corners and they would offer those long, flowery prayers so that everybody that was passing by would say, Whoa, that's a righteous man right there. You remember how the Lord compared the Pharisee with the publican? And the publican who merely beat upon his breast and said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. That man, Jesus said, went home justified rather than the man with the long, flowery prayer, to make a fair show in the flesh. How many in our day are all about the outside? How many preachers today are all about numbers? Or wanting to be perceived as with it? Now, one of the popular preachers of our day is a man named Stephen Furtick. You know, on Easter Sunday, he wore a sweater that was worth $2,000. By the way, it's hideous. You can look it up. But he wore a $2,000 sweater. There is actually an entire Instagram page dedicated to cataloging the excesses of modern money-loving preachers called Preachers and Sneakers. I did a quick perusal on their list and found preachers wearing shoes worth as much as $8,000. Can you imagine having an $8,000 pair of shoes? Can you imagine putting that on your stinky feet? Stepping out of the house. I mean, that'd have to be like enclosed in glass. But this guy's wearing those shoes in front of his people. $8,000 pair of shoes. It's all part of the show that modern churches put on. They're making a fair show in the flesh. Of course, it goes beyond the literal application of what they're wearing and what they're looking at. And it's the persona. It's the way they want to be perceived. The Pharisees love men's applause, and so they utilize religion to obtain it. It's all about, well, I want men to see me as somebody special. And the fear of men is what they operate in. Notice the second reason that they do what they do in verse number 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised, only lest they should suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. Back in Galatians chapter 5, verse number 11, some of these false teachers had even told the Galatians that Paul himself demanded they be circumcised. Paul said, I'm not demanding you be circumcised. If I would make you be circumcised, then I wouldn't have to be persecuted. The whole reason the Jews are hunting me down, the whole reason they hate me so much, the reason that I've been stoned, the reason I've been whipped, the reason I've been thrown into jail is because I tell the Gentiles, you don't have to be. If I gave in and taught that you had to be circumcised, then the persecution I'm under would cease. What he's getting at here in verse number, uh, verse number 12 are these teachers who are taking the easy road. You see, by teaching circumcision, now they won't be persecuted. They're teaching something that culture and society would be good with. They're not teaching something that society and the culture would hate. Oh, today we got a lot of preachers like that. Ones who won't preach what society doesn't want to hear. How many have given up preaching on the fact that there is a literal, eternal hell that is burning right now? But how many are preaching that? 
How many today will preach against sexual deviancy and stand up for the fact that marriage is between one man and one woman for life and anything else is a sin in the eyes of God? How many are preaching that? Why? Well, because they'll lose a following if they do. Society doesn't accept that, right? Society doesn't want to hear that. There's a lot in the Bible the Bible teaches that our society would like to just tear up and throw out. I mean, everybody would love to, you know, quote us uh, Matthew uh, chapter number 7 and judge not lest ye be judged, right? They like that verse. There's that verse and a few others they'll keep. But society wants the rest of it cut up, thrown out, and never heard from again. And there's a lot of preachers who are obliging it. Why'd they stop preaching it? Because they're a Pharisee. Because they're a false teacher. The Apostle Paul said, I will not shun to declare the whole counsel of God. They have a fear of man when they ought to have a fear of God. But you know, it's not just in the pulpits. It's in the pews. How many Christians are willing to tell others the truth? The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Again, we recognize that many today have become spineless and ultimately traitors to the truth. May we not be so at such a time as this. Notice the third reason in verse number 13. He says at the very end of the verse, he says, But they desire to have you circumcised, that they may glory in your flesh. They want a following. That major motivator to them is that popularity, that position, that prestige. Look at the following I've got. I'm a mega church pastor. Look at all these, and it's that popularity and prestige that, that motivates them. We see that with them in Galatians. We see that on so many hands today. But we notice in this passage, though, the preeminent purpose, and the Apostle Paul says, look, you know me. Look at the letter that I've written to you. My motivations are not to escape persecution and have a comfortable, easy life here. It's not to get a following for myself. I'm not in this just to make a fair show in the flesh. It's not about the outside. I want Jesus Christ to be glorified in you. He says in verse number 14, here's the emphasis of the Apostle Paul, and it's the emphasis on the cross. God forbid that I should glory, save or accept in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here's what my glory is. Here's what my glory shall be. God forbid, he says, may it not happen to me. May I not walk this road. Others may glory in their following. Some may glory in their position. Many glory in their possessions. Others glory in self-righteousness and personal accomplishments. Some glory in their heritage or lineage. But Paul says, God forbid that I'll glory in any of that. None of that can compare with the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Jeremiah chapter 9, verse 23 to 24. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Neither let the mighty man glory in his might. Let not the rich man glory in his riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understandeth and knoweth me. That I am the Lord which exercise loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight, saith the Lord. He talks about what people pursue and he sums it up into three things in Jeremiah 9. Wisdom, might, and riches what people are after and they glory in it wisdom look at how wise i am look at all my degrees look at all that i know my big egg head right <laughs> look at all of my wisdom and they glory in it and by the way in our society we have those that look at us as okay come on you little ones you sheep come to me i'll tell you how to live your life i've got wisdom because i've studied and know and and yet they know nothing because they don't even believe in God. So many like that, but they glory in their wisdom. And there's those who glory in their might. Look at, my, look at my position. Do you know what I could have done to you just by a snap of my finger? I have people at my disposal that will do this or will do that. Look at my might. And they glory in it. Some glory in their riches. I have so much. They're like that rich fool. What will I say to my soul? Wow, you've got it made. You can just take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. This is the life. Luxury. 
through riches. And people glory in these things. But here the Lord says, don't glory in that. It's all fool's gold. Every one of those things will be gone in a moment, the moment you take your last breath. None of it goes with you into eternity. And none of it brings satisfaction or fulfillment. All that the world offers is like, I call it, cotton candy. You ever take your kids, especially your boys, to a fair, to a, a carnival, to something like that, and, and you give them a chance to buy a snack, and when they're real little and they don't know better yet, they see the cotton candy, and these things are huge. They look so big. They're like, I'm starving. I need the cotton candy, right? Big eyes. And then it's funny, the first time a kid has cotton candy, is it not? I don't know if you've ever seen this. I've seen this now 10 times. Uh, But uh, you get that cotton candy, and they put it in their mouth, and it just, what happens? Gone. You know, big bite, and they're expecting you to just chew and chew, and it's just like, it's not even there. It's such a picture of what Solomon, the preacher of Ecclesiastes, called vanity. It looks so big. It looks so fulfilling. And yet there's nothing there. It's emptiness. The the preacher of Ecclesiastes, Solomon, he said, look, I tried it all. I had might. I had wisdom. I had riches. It's all vanity and vexation of spirit. That's what the world offers. The greatest possession is not any of those things. According to Jeremiah, it's a relationship with the Lord. Let a man glory that he knows me. You know what? You can't know God except for by the cross. Without the cross, none of us would have any relationship with God whatsoever. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. One way is the cross. And so that tells us of the excellency of the cross. Again, in verse number 15, For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth, un- availeth anything nor circumcision, not, uh, nor uncircumcision. That's not what matters. Availeth means to be strong, to have strength, to have ability, to have power. It has no ability to change you. Circumcision is just an outward ritual. He says it can't change the heart. He says what you need is the new creation in Christ Jesus. You need the new person, and that's what matters, and that's where power is. It's not in outward actions. The power is in the cross. So the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1, 23, We preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. It's Jesus Christ crucified. It's that he gave his life for me, a sinner, that Jesus Christ gave his life, that he rose again three days later, that I might be justified. It's the cross, at the cross. At the cross is where the awfulness of sin is magnified. How wicked am I? How miserable is my sinfulness? How wretched is my condition? Look at what Jesus had to endure in order to set you free. The cross. It's at the cross where the awesome love of God is even more magnified. When we consider our sin and we consider the counts against us, again, that song that we heard a little bit ago, and can it be? Amazing love. That he would die for me at the cross is where justice and mercy met. For there God was just and the justifier. At the cross, atonement for sin was made. The new covenant was ratified. Redemption's price was paid. At the Christ, at the cross, the way into the holiest was opened. At the cross, Jesus declared it is finished. The debt of sin was paid in full. The work of salvation was complete. The plan of God was fulfilled. It was at the cross where the power of sin over us was broken. At the cross where those who were at enmity with God are now reconciled to him at the cross. There's so great salvation, and that's secured to us by Jesus Christ who tasted death for every man. It was at the cross where Jesus Christ destroyed him that had the power of death that's the devil. It was at the cross that Jesus Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and by that one offering perfected forever them that are sanctified. It was at the cross where the good shepherd gave his life for the sheep. Is at the cross where the righteous became sin, that we, the sinner, might become righteous. At the cross. The cross means saving grace is available. 
The cross means sanctifying grace is available. And so we sing, at the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light. The burden of my heart rolled away. It was there by faith I received my sight. And now I'm happy all the day. At Calvary, mercy there was great, and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty. At Calvary, and so to that old rugged cross I'll ever be true. Its shame and reproach gladly bear. And I'll cherish that old rugged cross. It's where Jesus died for me. God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, when we were without strength, when we couldn't change our sinful condition, when we had no hope in the world, Jesus Christ in God's love came and died for me in my place at the cross. And so we find exchanges made because of the cross. And for the Apostle Paul, he says, I've exchanged the world for Jesus. I don't want anything that the world has to offer. Look at what he says in verse 14. God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. He said these other preachers and their motivations, it's all about what the world has to offer. They want notoriety, they want position, they want prestige. It's what the world is seeking to provide. It's what it's promising to give. He says, but I'm dead to the world. That day that I trusted Christ, I became one with Christ. And so remember those words of Galatians 2 and verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. So when Christ died, I died, Paul says. And so I'm dead to the world. That world that hated Jesus. That world that wanted nothing to do with Jesus. That world when Pilate said, what shall I do with your king? And the people, requ- and the people responded saying, we have no king but Caesar. Away with him. Crucify him. That world that wanted nothing to do with Jesus. He says, now it wants nothing to do with me because I'm one with Jesus Christ. And that Jesus, that one who's separate from sinners, that one who has his own kingdom that he was calling men to, repent, he said, The kingdom of heaven's at hand. It's offered to you. He says, I'm part of that kingdom now. The world's dead to me and I'm dead to the world. He says, I'm not interested in what the world has to offer. The notoriety, the prestige, the position, the riches, all those things that these other men are after. He says, I don't care any any of it. He says, I want Christ to be glorified. It's about the cross That's what my life is about. That was his exchange that the Apostle Paul had made. It was all about the cross. He gloried in the cross. The cross was his cause. The cross was his banner. You know, and we in our own lives can ask this as a child of God. If you've been saved this morning, are you focused on the things that matter? Is your life about the cross? Maybe you're one that's pursuing the positions and the prestige and the riches that the world promises. Understand understand today, again, that's just cotton candy. It's nothing. It's Jesus Christ. It's where true riches are. It's for Jesus Christ that we must live. Make the exchange today. I love what the Apostle Paul said in the book of Corinthians. He said, when I became a man, I put away childish things. You know, in my own life as a kid, there were things that I gloried in, things that I had possession of. I said, hey, you know, look at my G.I. Joes. Then I talked to my friends. How many G.I. Joes do you got? I got over 50. G.I. Joe's. But then G.I. Joe's lost their luster, and I made an exchange, and then it was baseball cards. How many baseball cards do you got? Oh, you got 2,000. <laughs> I've got 5,000 baseball cards, by the way. I have over 100 Ryan Sandberg baseball cards. How about that? Didn't that make me something? And then I look at the other guys, and they'd be like, wow. You have over a hundred of Ryan Sandberg? You have a Ryan Sandberg rookie card? And boy, I was big stuff. But you know what? If you were to come to my house today, I couldn't show you a single G.I. Joe. I couldn't show you a single baseball card in my possession. 
because I grew up. Those things don't matter to me. What do you want for your birthday? I want kids that love God and serve Him. I want God to be glorified, right? In our lives, question, child of God, Christian today, are you living for the things that matter? What is your glory? What do you count as your greatest possession, your greatest treasure? The Apostle Paul said, God forbid that I should glory in anything except for the cross. It's the cross. Do you know in this passage we also see there's another exchange that perhaps some here need to make? And that's trading the powerless religion of men for the powerful, mighty work of Christ. Again, in verse number 15, In Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Religious works do not avail anything. If you come today and if I were to ask you, i say, why, why do you have hope for eternal life? You stood before God and he said, why should I let you into my kingdom? If your answer would be, well, I've lived a good life, or hey, I belong to this church, or I've given X amount of money, or I got baptized, or I went through confirmation. I want you to hear what the Bible says about all of that. It's filthy rags. You say, does it really say that? Read it, Isaiah 64. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the eyes of God. The Apostle Paul spoke of an exchange in his own life. There was a time where he looked at all of his religious activity and he said, this is it. This is what I glory in. This is what's going to get me to God. And he talked about his heritage and he talked about his accomplishments and he talked about his zeal for the Lord and all these things. But then he saw Jesus and he made a trade. He says, I count all this as dung, as nothing for Christ. So the greatest exchange is for you in your own life to come and to say, look, it's not what I've done. It's not my works. It's what Jesus did. I'm not righteous, and these things can't make me righteous. They avail nothing. There's no power there. But Jesus Christ, he's the Savior. He's the Redeemer. He can cleanse me and make me right with God. Jesus' own words, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Believe the gospel. By faith we're saved. Trust Jesus. Trust Jesus. In the very first stories of the book of Genesis, you'll find the two ways that people try to approach God. You have the way of Cain, who came by his own efforts. He brought forth of the fruit of the ground and everything that he had done. He bought the, uh, brought, brought the best of it, all those things that he had grown, and he offered it to God. He said, God, accept me. Look what I've done for you. The Bible says God could not accept Cain. Then here came Abel, and he came God's way, and he sacrificed a spotless lamb and shed its blood, the best of the flock, and he gave it to God. And the Bible says that God received Abel's sacrifice. Why? Because he brought that which God demanded, the blood of a sinless substitute. Remember, it was a picture of Jesus, Jesus, the Lamb of God, which takes away the sins of the world. And this morning, all of us who are trying to approach God are either coming the way Cain did and depending on our own best efforts, or we've come the way of Abel and said, I need the blood. I'm a sinner. Jesus, save me. Those are the two options. And if you're here today and you've tried to come to God by your religious works, by your good deeds, understand you have no place with God. He cannot receive you by those things because your sin must be cleansed. It must be atoned for. There's one way. Humble yourself. Acknowledge you're a sinner and come and say, Jesus, save me. You're all I need. 
you're sufficient, your work on the cross, you said it is finished, I believe it's done, and I'm just going to come and rest in your work. You bring me to the Father as you said that you would, and by faith cry out to Jesus, and Jesus saves. Have you made that exchange? Have you called on Jesus to save you from your sin and make you new? Again, the only thing that matters is the new creature. Jesus said, you must be born again. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. It's only by faith in Christ's work on the cross in his resurrection the new birth is possible. Do you hear the word of God today? Again, the Apostle Paul tells us here in this passage, look, there's, there's two groups of motivations here. The impure and the pure. There's a lot of reasons people are doing what they're doing, religiously speaking, to be seen of men, to escape persecution because it's a comfortable way of life, to gain a following, notoriety, position, prestige. There's a whole lot of reasons that people are living, but they're the wrong reasons. Exchange them today and come in glory in the cross. The cross is what saves, the cross is what motivates, the cross is the cause for the child of God. Let's pray. Father, I come to you today. I thank you, Lord, for your word. I thank you for this testimony of the Apostle Paul. Lord, I, I pray that your word has been clear. I pray that you would apply it to every heart in life. Father, you know who is in our midst that has not come to rely on the cross of Christ to save them from their sins and to grant them eternal life. And Lord, I pray that today it would be clear to them what your demand is. Lord, that today they would put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ to be saved and be made new. Father, I pray that you be with those who have been saved. Lord, you know how easy it is for us to get our priorities and our mind and our pursuits messed up. Lord, help us to live for the right reason. Help us to live because you died for us, because you live for us. And Lord, we're one with you. Help us, Lord, that the cross would be our glory. Father, I pray you be glorified in your people and how we respond to your word. Bless this invitation, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.